Okay. I think we'll get started just because I know we've got quite a lot to cover. Um, obviously, other people, if they're joining, can join later. Um, so firstly, thanks to everyone that's joined us. My name's Abby. I'm the current um, vice chair for BUSA. And if we could just go around quickly to the other speakers, just to introduce themselves. So Keith, do you want to introduce yourself? Briefly? Oh, hold on. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Keith. Um, I'm sort of here with a KSL hat on with a team racing um, background and so on and so forth. I've run Firefly fleets and fleets um, within school, university and commercial settings for the last 20 years. Um, so hopefully I'm here to give you some tips and hints in terms of actually how to make the best value out of your fleets going forwards. Um, yeah, over to Joe. Hi, so I'm Joe. I was the Boosted Development Officer last year and I've kind of come to the, I've uh, been asked to talk uh, this largely around uh, my work while I was Commodore of UHI, where we took a fleet that wasn't in necessarily the kind of greatest of conditions and through a kind of combination of things I'm going to talk about, uh, we ended up with a fleet that we're now very happy with um, and what kind of what the, you might be able to learn from what uh, we've managed to uh, achieve from that. Great. And then Alex, do you want to just introduce yourself as well? Hello, um, I'm uh, here with my um, National Firefly Association hat on. So I'm the technical secretary of the National Firefly Association. Um, and we're keen for everyone. Um, so when they're improving their boats and they're replacing their boats to keep them nice and class legal so you can come um, fleet racing with us. Great, thank you very much. So just to kind of give a quick overview of, of what we're going to cover, obviously people have just mentioned some of it, but Keith's going to speak first all about his kind of expertise around getting your fleet in order and, and keeping them that way. Joe's then going to talk a bit about the, the, the budget boat replacement options. So they did some great work up at UHI where they really didn't have much money, but they've actually now got a perfectly usable fleet that enables them to run team racing up there. Um, I'm then going to speak briefly around boat replacement programs. So as well as my booster hat, I used to be the Commodore of Loughborough. Um, and in the kind of four years I was there, we managed to get ourselves some new fireflies from Rondart twice. Um, so I learned quite a lot of lessons from that three year gap in the middle of trying to find 50K twice in four years. Um, and I'll just share a few of those lessons that we've learned for anyone that's going on down the brand new boats um, pathway. So just a couple of kind of Zoom rules. I guess everyone's pretty happy with Zoom, we've done this for a quite a long time now, but if you can please just mute yourself if you're not talking. Um, if you have any questions, please stick those in the chat at any point. We will be um, we will be coming back to questions at the end, but please do stick them in at any point. And if any of the speakers notice, like take them when you want. Um, and yeah, up to you if you want to turn your camera on or not, if you, if you have a question that you want to ask in person. Um, if you would rather ask it in person, just stick your name in the chat and we'll invite you to speak. Cool, so I guess without further ado, Keith, do you wanna take over? Let me know when you want me to switch slides. Um, you might as well go from that one, Abby, if you wouldn't mind. Cool, hi everybody. Um, slightly, where I'm gonna to start today is very much on sort of the main principles and the key principles. We're all pretty much, everybody I think is pretty familiar in terms of looking their own, after their own boats, everybody's done it before. However, there's quite a big difference between actually what one would expect and what you should expect to do with your own boat as you would expect to do with a fleet boat. Now, starting right at the beginning, it is understanding who is responsible for what and where and how. So who is responsible for the short-term planning, the long-term planning, and then even the replacement planning. So it's all well and good to sit here today saying our fireflies are rubbish, but as Abby sort of already said, actually it's quite a big cost to try and find that. It's not something that you can turn around normally within a year and go to a union and say, we need to find 50,000 pounds. Actually, it's a two, three, four, five year plan to be able to get that. Now, therefore passing that information 
on from the committee that you have today to the committee tomorrow to the committee next year and so on and so forth is really, really, really important. And a lot of universities struggle, particularly because they only think about now, they don't think about tomorrow. So within this whole aspect of who is responsible for what is really, really key. Now, obviously, the here today, who is responsible for looking after the boats? Who is responsible for making sure that they are able to go sailing next Wednesday afternoon? Who is responsible for making sure that you have got some money available that you can buy the spare parts you need for the event that you've got happening in three or four weeks' time? Who is responsible for making sure that people are looking after the boats, that when they get in them, they're actually not stealing bits from other boats to make sure everything's happening? Who is then responsible for actually saying, if you don't treat the boats very well what are the repercussions of that are you charging some of your students for example if somebody puts a hole, a hole in a boat because they're being an idiot are you actually charging that back to them and is that an appropriate thing for you to be doing so there's lots of different things there now they're all going to be very different questions and different answers depending on the relationship you have with your a you depending on who owns the boats and how that sort of comes in so there's no one size fits all idea here in terms of actually how ownership really works the important thing though to really think about here is that ownership in a ownership really and that taking ownership decides how much you're going to spend so move sort of that mindset of it's not your own boat. Actually, spending five pounds on a UJ on your own boat is not that big a deal. But spending 30, 40, 50 pounds on UJs because you've got a whole fleet to do starts to become a big deal. So actually understanding that there is a difference between how you buy things for you and how you buy things for your fleet is actually one of the big things that to some degree is where I'm trying, going to try and cover in the next sort of five or 10 minutes. It is a different mindset. And that's what you really need to think about. Your own boat, you're willing to spend time on to look after. You want to make it the best thing that you possibly can. A fleet boat isn't yours. The work and the investment that you put in is not necessarily going to be repaid to you individually next year, the year after, and so on and so forth. So actually that time that you put in, you want to be making sure is time that is A, improving things, but actually it's time that's making it easier for you tomorrow and your future people that are coming in. So highlighting what it is to, that can make things work better is actually one of the key parts here as well. Um, Abby, can we go on to the next slide? Please. So, thinking about this in three different ways, there's two key maintenance approaches that as a fleet are really important. The planned maintenance, the reactive maintenance. I'm I've put damage in on this slide just because that also sort of falls into a similar sort of an area, but it is quite different. Planned maintenance, those maintenance things that actually we say, right, we've got, 50 pounds this year to spend, 100 pounds this year. Different clubs will have different amounts. What is going to be the best value spend that you can do to improve on your boats? Now, it might be that actually all of your boats need better bow fenders, that perhaps the standing rigging on your boats hasn't been replaced ever since they were bought. There's all sorts of things like that. Now, when you look at a fleet, Often it's very easy to say, actually, what we want to do is we want to replace all of the UJs across the fleet because they're starting to go. Or we'll replace all of the toe straps because actually replacing everything in one go makes things a lot easier if you can afford it. If you can't afford it, actually having that in mindset of actually over the next two or three years, we need to replace all the toe straps. Does that mean in terms of how you buy things, it makes life, it, it changes that mindset of saying, I'm going to buy one now, one next year or in future, or similarly, 
if I bulk buy on these things, what is my discount options available to us? So there's a variety of sort of ways within there. The planned maintenance, again, linking back to before, should always make it easier to look after your boats. The story that I want to use on this one is, uh, is, a U, is the UJ. The UJ is in many ways a consumable item. And you've got to think about your UJs as consumable items. Now, across a fleet, there's nothing worse than having two boats with UJs from one manufacturer, another two boats with UJs from a different manufacturer, another two boats with UJs from somewhere else. Maybe you've got your Picos or your, your 200s have UJs from another fleet. Actually, what that means is you therefore need to carry that same number of spare UJs in your spares pack. So not only are you having to have that pain and that struggle of trying to get the wrong UJ to fit onto the right fitting on the wrong end of a tiller, you've also got to actually try and work out where they came from and everything else. Now, that's not something that's easy to turn around and say, actually, we're going to replace all of our UJs. If you've got six boats, if you've got 10 boats, if you've got 20 boats, that's a big amount of money. However, going back to the idea of ownership, taking a decision and saying over the next year, two years, 18 months, when we replace UJs, we are going to replace them with this type. And it's something that's written down. It's something that's passed on. It's something that's passed over. What you'll find in two or three years time is that you now no longer need six, seven UJs in spare. You only need one. And actually when you use that one, you replace it. Therefore, it's not a bigger expense going over the next two or three years as you're, as you're replacing them. But in the future, it's a massive saving. And that whole idea works for that planned maintenance aspect on a fleet set of boats. And that's where one of the big differences is in terms of your own boat as opposed to a fleet boat. Now, sort of leads us on to that reactive and I've sort of covered that within it. Again, I'm going to talk about events in a little while, but stick with the UJ idea. If you're running an event and a team racing event and you're putting your fireflies out there on and you've got three boats with a UJ from Allen Brothers, three boat, three, two with a UJ from Harkin and one with a UJ from RWO. What that means is when one of those UJs breaks, it's going to take you time to get those boats back on the water. And one of the things that you've got to think about as well with a fleet boat is it's doing a job. It's providing a service. It's providing a service to you and it's providing a service to the other people that are there sailing. If it is not adequately providing a service, it's not providing good value, and therefore, actually, it's not doing the job that you need it to do. It's a sort of a, it is that link into, it should be easy again. It should be easy, it should be cheaper if we can make it happen. One of the other challenges with reactive maintenance is that when we react, when we do things without necessarily planning them, over time, the quality of the boats will degrade. And what happens is you repair something quickly because that's all you've got time to do. So you put a, you put a quick repair together. In future, that repair is going to fail. So you'll put another repair on it and then a repair again. And then what you end up with, and you all are familiar with fireflies and other boats in university sailing around the country, where repair has been put on repair, has been put on repair. And ultimately, I think Joe will probably mention this later, what you end up with is a boat that actually is almost impossible to repair and has no value and has no real use going forwards. So that reactive maintenance approach, all it leads to is boats that are ultimately going to fall apart. So yes, you've got to react to damage but it's reacting to damage in the right way that actually means that you keep the quality and you keep the expectations of the boat being able to perform going forward. Abby, can we go to the next slide, please? So I've probably covered most of this already. Now, the quality question is one that 
I think often comes up and it links into this idea of what is the right part for you to buy for your boats. Stick with the UJ idea. There are a range of manufacturers that make different UJs and they range from two pounds all the way through to about 15, 20 pounds each. Now, which is the right one to choose? Buying a two pound one, chances are, the way that it's manufactured, the, the history of it, it's probably not gonna last very long. The 15, 20 pound one, is it gonna last any longer than the five or six pound one? Chances are probably not. But therefore understanding and taking a balance as to when is it wise not to spend, or when is it wise to spend that little bit more to make sure that the parts that you're going to buy are gonna last beyond next week, the week after. Again, it's a fleet boat. It's a boat that has a job to do. It's got to perform. If you're always breaking things, it's not doing its job. So it links into that aspect here of delivering performance, making sure that the boats are actually ready to go afloat and able to go afloat in an easy way and that actually is not taking you, your boatswains or anybody else huge amounts of time to be able to actually just put a boat on the water. Um, a little story that I will have with one of my first fleets, which was a fleet of 12 420s. When I first took them over, they didn't work. And simply every single boat was different. Every UJ was different, every rudder. There was no chance of actually doing it. And I spent probably most of my time just repairing things that fell apart. And it was not efficient, it's not a good way, it's not a nice way that you suddenly find that you're repairing something that you repaired last week because actually it's, you just haven't got the time or the capability to actually keep doing proper planned maintenance on these sorts of things. So think about your reliability, think about your uptime, think about when it is right to spend a little bit more money rather than just going to the cheapest possible thing that you can actually find. Sometimes, yeah, absolutely, cheap is the right way to go. Sometimes, I'll use the UJ version again, it's actually better to go a little bit more expensive. It's not necessarily great to go all the way to the most expensive, but it's generally a better idea to buy something that you know is going to work and be reliable than it is that something might break in the future, in a short term. Abby, could we go on to the next one? So, making time. This is again a hard part why should you make time to look after your boats now make a boat tells a story about you the boatswain and b about the club or about the people that own that boat we all know from team racing events and events that we've otherwise been to when we turn up and we find that actually before we get into the first race, we're straggling around, we're trying to find that last shackle, we're trying to find that little bit of string to repair a toe strap. Actually, when you go afloat, you're already disappointed with what, you, what you're going to go out in. And actually, as a sailor, it's then very difficult to say, I want to look after this boat. And little things like actually saying, when people turn up to go sailing in your boats, and this doesn't, this is your own members as much as it is people that are coming to see you as, as, as an event. A boat that is all ready to go is going to give a much better impression than one that's already in bits, that the cover's in pieces, that it's all, all, all messy and dirty. One of the best things you can do with a boat to make it actually people look after it is to get a hose out and give it a wash. Nothing more, you don't need to spend any money, find some time, get out there with a scrubbing brush, some decent cleaner and give your boat a clean. And quite simply, next time somebody comes in, people will look and say, these boats are cared for, these boats are looked after and they themselves will then look after it for you. What that does is it reduces damage, it reduces, it reduces the amount of money you've then got to spend on repairs and spares and ultimately, just little things like that will make an ongoing difference. And it's not about just today again, it's coming back to this idea of how do we make it easy and how do we think about 
next week, next year, and going forward. And it doesn't have to cost a huge amount of money either. Abby, can we go to the next one? Events. I've sort of mentioned most of this already. So first impressions are absolutely key. Um, we've Again, we've been to so many Firefly events where the boats actually are just falling apart and they look a mess. And straight away, generally, you know that the amount of racing that people are going to get, that the amount of fun that people are going to get out of that event is not going to be as good as, as it could be. If you're hosting, it is things like making preparations, getting them right, cleaning the boats, checking them, doing those repairs that might otherwise you might have otherwise overlooked. So one of the big ones there is, for example, a firefly toe strap where the little strops come through the thwarts. Those regularly fail. Check them before, before your event. If they're fraying, replace them. It's, a, it's 20 centimetres of string. It's not a big job. It's not a costly job, but it will make a big difference to how people actually behave and treat your boats going all the way through. Similarly, make sure you have the right spares, the parts that actually you need. And this links back to the idea of how many different UJs do you need? If you all have, if all of your boats have a standard UJ on, you only need a couple of tiller extensions spare. It's a really simple, but very, very base, um, very, very effective way of making sure that everything is going to work. Again, being simple. Keep it basic. One of the other examples that I'll give, and I think this is probably hopefully my last story as such. Um, a flight of fireflies that we used at an event a few years ago. Somebody had spent, the boatswain had spent an awful lot of time splicing in the most amazing uh, kicker system. And they'd used some really nice Dyneema with some thimbles and all sorts of things, and they created a beautiful kicker across all six of their boats. Problem was, is that as soon as those splices started to fray and things started to chafe through, everything fell apart. And actually with a spliced system like that, with a thimble, if it's not spliced, it's not going to work. And what we ended up with was all six boats, essentially we had to re-rig the kickers during the course of the day, because the splices, while they looked lovely and they were great, it didn't fit the need for what the boats were actually being there for. They'd spent a lot of money on Dyneema, on expensive bits of kit and so on and so forth, that have been much better to buy some standard polyester that actually they can just tie some knots in with some basic blocks and keep it simple. And actually something that's then quick and easy to replace when they're actually doing it. Again, this links back to, it's not your boat, it's a fleet boat, and it's a boat that has to do a job. So really do think, yes, great, on my boat, I've got some very nice spliced in bits of thimbles and some really Gucci bits of kit. I'd never put that on a fleet boat. It's not in the interest of the fleet, it's expensive, and it doesn't deliver the job that I need it to do. It makes my life easier on my own boat, but we're not in that own boat position. Last slide from me, Abby, please. So, just in very quickly, so a quick summary. What we're trying to do with the fleet, we're trying to make sure that we are looking after it, we're trying to make sure that we know and we understand where that fleet and where those boats are going. And the key things here, we want to maximise the time that we can go sailing. We want to minimise the amount of effort, the amount of time that we are spending repairing, fixing, replacing, we want to make sure that we are keeping our costs as low and as far down as we possibly can. Again, every time you start multiplying things by six, by 10, by 12, think about those people that run fleets, you know, schools or um, commercial centers where they're running fleets of 30, 40, 60 boats or more. Every time you multiply up, it becomes a big, big, big deal. So thinking about making it simple, thinking about making it sensible, but also making sure that you've got that plan. I'll remind you again, these boats are not yours. They are fleet boats. You all know how to look after your own boats, but it is a different mindset 
which reads different choices as to what you should be putting into on your fleet boats. Wherever you can, avoid the quick fix. If you're gonna do it, do it properly. If you have a problem on one boat, the chances are you're gonna have the same problem on the other boats. So if you break a tow strap on one, check the tow straps on all six. If, you, if a main sheet starts fraying on one, check the main sheets on the other boats. It's a lot easier to replace all of one thing at one time, just in terms of time and expense and everything else, if you can do it. Anyway, I think probably that's more than enough from me. Um, I'll be passing on to Joe. I'm here. Do please drop me questions in chat or if you want to email me afterwards or anything else like that. I'm here and very happy to chat and talk it through. And if you've got different ideas or anything else, like that, there's no right answer. So these are just some of the things that I've found out. So you know, do just ask. Anyway, over to you, Joe. Hi, all. So as Keith said, I'm Joe. And um, what I'm going to be kind of talking about is that whole process of taking a, we were kind of, I founded UHI in 2016. And this is a whole kind of process of how we went about getting uh, boats, how we looked at funding them and what I ended up having to kind of do to get them to be in a more saleable fashion, uh, more saleable state, I think is probably the kindest way to put it. So a little bit of background, 2016, the club was founded and we had an agreement with the local sailing club to borrow fevers, which were fine. We had four fevers, we could get members in, we could get some funding together, we could go sailing. But if, as uh, you can all imagine, this isn't necessarily the greatest uh, if we want to then go team racing, we want to go fleet racing, we want to do anything that really requires kind of student sailing, we kind of wanted to buy fireflies. And the advantage at the time was that there were, I through various contacts, I knew that three flights were likely to be coming up for sale fairly soon. And they were coming up relatively kind of cheaply. Um, so it's Glasgow, Loughborough and Oxford. And based on this, it's nice and straightforward. If we look at the next slide, um, once we know how much money we need, we can look at funding it. So if we want somewhere between, we eventually decided that kind of about 8K was a sensible kind of mark to start at. And because we were new, this meant we had a slightly different funding strategy than some of the more established clubs could have. And this is the kind of stuff that I talk about um, in the 10 minute guide on the Boosa website. Um, there are kind of equivalent uh, suggestions on funding, but this is kind of the one that's um, the one I've already written. And Think about your kind of major selling points. How are you acquiring that money? Well, we knew that we were good because, uh, had good selling points because we were in a slightly old place. We were very new. We were very diverse in terms of the kind of baseline of um, who was a member of our sailing club. Not only just compared to the kind of general um, West Coast of uh, Scotland sailing scene, but also actually if you potentially look and compare yourself to the OA Insights um, published uh, data, which is kind of a general baseline of all the clubs across the UK. Student sailing clubs tend to come out pretty well in that in terms of gender ratios, numbers of international students was one we particularly focused on, and the previous kind of sporting performance of uh, our women's team was particularly good. So at this point, the straightforward solution was to make a list of absolutely every funder I could possibly ever find and approach absolutely every one of them. And this is the kind of thing that I talk about again in the kind of 10 minute funding guide. We weren't very successful. Um, and I'm sure Abby will bring this up uh, again as well because she was trying to acquire even more money than we were. Mostly funding applications get rejected, but eventually through a number of different funds, we did manage to get together uh, enough money we managed to get together about £8,000 um, to look at acquiring boats. So, if we go on to the next slide. What we ended up doing uh, was I uh, looked around, worked out who, was going to get, uh, who we were going to get the best deal from, and Loughborough was absolutely kind of head, uh, head and shoulders above in terms of what kind of quality of deal we could get, uh, because we ended up paying 
£8,000 for six boats, plus trailers, plus extra sails. And the reason for this is because some of the boats had, a, had their uh, idiosyncrasies, they had their issues. Um, so these are just kind of a couple of photos I took at the time. Um, but the kind of obvious issues were the kind of rubbing strips were coming off, they were covered in dings in various locations. It was kind of the classic cracking. And you can see actually on the right hand side, just to the left of uh, the shroud, there is actually some fairly major damage on the side of this hull. So if we could go to the next slide, please, Abby. If we've got a collection of boats with some existing issues, these might be your boats, these might be boats you've just bought. There are a couple of different options. What can we potentially do to uh, get these back up to a standard which we can be proud of them for? Well, you can just hire a professional. This is the kind of the most straightforward answer. Um, there are plenty of professional boat builders out there. And generally, if you approach them and go, we'll provide, uh, we'll, we need six boats fixed, they'll give you a fairly sensible kind of deal if you have that kind of conversation nice and early. And the problem with that though, is it tends to be quite expensive. However you sell it, it's going to be several thousand pounds per boat potentially, which automatically means that quite often we were a very small club. You guys may also uh, have kind of cash flow issues. Um, we just didn't have any money to spend on professional refits of any of these boats. Um, and we were quoted about a thousand pounds per boat, which if, uh, given this, these boats were valued at about a thousand pounds, probably suggested that uh, the best solution was instead, um, I was going to have to learn to do it myself. So learning to do it yourself is a bit of, is a very kind of broad um, question. And I did have the advantage in this particular uh, in this particular uh, game, in that I already had a little bit of kind of baseline uh, knowledge. I'd been boasting for Newcastle, and the most by far and away the most important thing, I did already have some kind of a network in the kind of marine industry. And this is the kind of one of the things that is worth coming back to. Marine industry, everyone is really friendly as a general rule and really willing to talk to you about how do I fix this? How do I adjust this? I want to do this. Have you ever come across this problem before? Um, so going to people like Keith was a very much a kind of, at one point it was virtually a daily thing of sending in emails going, I have no idea how to fix this problem. But actually it took two years and we had to run five boats at any one time. But eventually we've now got, UHI have now got a fleet they can be really proud of. So if we look at the next slide. How do we come about, uh, go about doing this? Well, in all these things, there tend to be a number of different kind of common challenges, a lot of which have uh, Keith already talked about. And the kind of classic, who owns the boats? Who respects the kit? And we had a slightly different solution to uh, the one Keith had in terms of, instead of just thinking about it as this is the university's fleet, I, ex uh, I explicitly built into the um, kind of working practices of UHI that it's not the club's fleet, it's our fleet. So as an alternative uh, kind of solution to the we maintain a fleet is everyone maintains a fleet. There was a collective responsibility clause uh, into the constitution, full nine yards. So if you broke it, I taught you to fix it. If I didn't know how to fix it, we would learn to fix it together. And this kind of brings me on to the um, kind of one of our, uh, one of the things which worked particularly well was the kind of picture in the middle is I convinced a couple of professional boat builders that what they really wanted to do with a, one of their weekends is to come and uh, help teach the rest of the club and the wider kind of sailing community in Oban potential uh, strategies and potential methods of fixing boats, using our boats as demonstrations. There are, were also, of course, a couple of more West Coast of Scotland specific kind of challenges. 
the location and weather, it tends to be very wet. When it's not wet, it tends to be very midgy. Sometimes you just have to kind of push up with it, unfortunately. And as I mentioned before, it took me two years and there was some very significant learning on the job. I will completely hold my hands up. I made a complete hash of some of the uh, early kind of uh, early repairs I did. And at the end of the day, the only option that you have at that point is to remove the repair, potentially remove the years of repairs under it, where people have also made a hash and haven't really repaired that. And you just have to strip the whole thing back and start again from scratch. But eventually, you'll get good at it. And it may take a while, unfortunately. And this is the whole thing about having that uh, continuity of experience and having that uh, kind of on the job training. If you have an experienced bosun to learn from or you make friends with a boat builder, it's really the whole learning experience is much quicker and much easier than trying to learn by Googling it yourself. And um, if someone could just look over your shoulder and go, oh, oh, no, whatever. You need a bit more hardener in that. So if we would like to go to the next slide, please, Abby. What I have from this is a couple of kind of very general um, tips in terms of things that we've absolutely learned from this whole kind of thing, alongside that to need to build that shared ownership and to absolutely network, uh, network your socks off. A couple of really general things, buy very serious heavy duty personal protective equipment, face masks, gloves, clothing, full nine yards. You only have one set of lungs, you only have one set of eyes. A lot of the kind of particularly the resins you work with, uh, will end up working with, will do some quite interesting things to the human body in large quantities and no one wants to, uh, no one wants to deal with that. Then as I, uh, as I talk about elsewhere on the Booster website, planning. So, and Keith has brought this up as well. If you've got a major repair to do, sitting down and potentially sketching out, coming up with, talking to people and having that kind of idea of, okay, I need to, potentially angle grind out this section and I'm then going to need foam, I'm going to need chopped strand, I'm going to need this, that, the next thing. It's absolutely, if you plan that ahead, then what you don't find is you angle grind out a section of the hull and now you have a boat with a hole in it and no way of fixing it because you forgot to order the relevant uh, kit to fix it with. And kind of linked to that, what kind of repair are you doing? Is this the kind of repair where you're halfway through an event and someone's done something really daft and actually you just need a boat on the water tomorrow and so you can kind of, you can effectively bodge it and understand that on Monday, Tuesday, some point next week, you're going to have to take out your existing repair and do it properly. Or is this something where you can take the boat off the water and you can sit down and think about it, sketch out your plan, work out what you need, and potentially take a week, two weeks, a month to get this boat back up to the kind of standards which are equivalent to the rest of the fleet. And finally, just if you ever happen to be searching for sources of water into particularly side tanks, um, the odds are pretty good that it's because there is an existing hole in the hull to a fitting or a hatch cover them because there was some mystery hole in the hull that you can't find. Um, so there are uh, potential methods if you've got bungs in place to use air to work out where the hole is. But realistically, one of the major sources of water is because things aren't sealed in properly. So actually potentially taking your fittings off and resealing them will solve a lot of your earlier problems. And doing it properly the first time round, as Keith keeps uh, uh, as Keith kept bringing up. If you are having to replace this, it's likely to be a consistent issue. Taking off that hatch cover, for example, and just resealing it. If you do it to all of them, you're unlikely to have the same problem uh, on all the other boats. So, thank you very much for listening. If we jump to the next, my next slide, my kind of general conclusion is absolutely talking to people, 
having a kind of network of people you can talk to. So drop me an email, my email's on there, or find me on Twitter or uh, UK Coaching or ResearchGate, anywhere like that. Um, do you give me, uh, do you drop me a line? Or Keith, as he uh, has said, he's already happy to, uh, for you to talk to. And there's oh, a huge amount of existing boat builders, composite manufacturers, who are also, if you, for example, go onto the East Coast Fiberglass website, they have videos which show you how to use your products, uh, use their products. Or if you go on to the West Coast, um, excuse me, West Systems Composites uh, YouTube, they also have a YouTube uh, guide on how to use their equipment. So talking to people, local boat builders, local channelries are also another good source. And the Booster website, there is uh, stuff already on there that, uh, about funding your boats, about how you might repair your boats once you've uh, kind of, if you have an issue or you need to get it from a standard where we've just freshly purchased it and we're not really sure if they float, back to a point where we can be proud of them again. So thank you very much for listening. Please do drop me an email, give me some kind of uh, call, of, uh, and I will pass you over to Abby. Great, thank you very much, Joe. Cool, so I'm just gonna kind of finish up with, uh, I guess, less of a maintenance focused um, chat, but more kind of our experience with, with the new boats approach and the, and the ordering brand new boats from, from Ronda approach. So, just to set a little bit of context, I started at Loughborough in 2016. At the time, we had a flight of boats who I actually probably wouldn't be exaggerating by saying were possibly one of the worst in the country, to the point where you can see, obviously Joe's shown you a few photos already, but when I say bad, absolutely terrible. Like gaffer tape had been used to fix absolutely everything. Uh, my first experience of student sailing really was this picture on the bottom left going to a very wet, cold, windy fleet in a firefly, the mast just snapped on the start line two races in, back to Loughborough Saturday night to find another mast to come back. As Keith said, it's just, it's not the way to sell your club to new members and it's something you don't really want to get yourself into. So yeah, we had this big issue. The boats were over 25 years old. I think they'd come from Ireland originally literally verging on unsailable. We, during training, never trained with six boats. There would always be at least one or two that weren't sailable. I'm sure some of you may be familiar with the old piece of wood to fix the thwarts uh, situation. It's, yeah, pretty dark times. So I feel your pain if your club is currently in, in this kind of situation. Um, in terms of the position of Loughborough Students Union, we, you know, whilst the AU supported us in other ways, they, they weren't able to give us any funding. Um, and I know that's the same for a lot of clubs, but despite the Bucks success at the time, Loughborough had won Bucks match racing about two or three years in a row. They'd come second at yachting, third at team racing. Bucks medals were in pretty good supply for the club at the time. Um, still, we were kind of taking the boats to them and saying, you're not going to keep getting these Bucks medals if, if we don't have a club, because that's really the, the point it had got to. Um, so, yeah, I guess kind of lessons learned from this original situation is just start early. So don't wait until you find yourself um, in the situation that we were in a few years ago. If you're sitting here at this webinar thinking, I'm now a bosun and I'm getting to the point where I'm fixing things most weeks, think about what Keith said, do that, that proactive maintenance, not the reactive maintenance, because otherwise, even if it's not for you, the cohort of students in five years time are going to be in this situation where actually they can't run their activities because the boats are falling to pieces. The second thing is around having that conversation with your student union or, or whatever the equivalent is at your, at your uni, have that conversation with them early. So work out, you know, is there support that they can give you? I would hope that a lot of student unions, if you kind of say to them for our club to run and for us to offer this to students, like we need boats, I would hope that some would be supportive with that and, and they would be able to help you fund them. But the question is around how they manage their capitals. So I know of some universities who have a situation where their university will happily fund a flight of boats, but then that's kind of it for 10, 20 years. They don't want to pay for things more than once, but they can give you that initial outlay. 
there are others where they can't they don't have 50 grand lying around to give you but potentially they could help you fund towards your target so they could give you a couple of grand potentially so make sure you've had that conversation with your au and you know you know what the situation is going to be and then like he'd said i'm not going to stress this point anymore um that tape can fix anything mentality you can see in this picture holding gunnels on with duct tape just just doesn't work so don't find yourself in that situation and, and really try and keep on top of that maintenance so then i guess the second situation is, is then the fundraising and we've spoken a little bit about this already but as joe said it's it's not something that's easy before i even started uni the committee before me had for about four or five years been trying to find 50 grand for boats um, they had applied to pretty much every local business for sponsorship. They'd applied to all those grant programs that Joe had spoken about. So the Sun Cell Funding the Future. Basically, think of a grant program. Loughborough had applied and probably not got anything. Um, and again, everyone says, oh, yeah, write to local businesses, get your club sponsored. But I'm sure a lot of you are aware it really doesn't happen very often. Um, even at the time, Loughborough had been to the World Championships, like the University Match Racing Worlds, Student World Cup for yachting. Still, no one was interested. They, they were not interested in sponsoring a student sailing team. So we found ourselves in autumn 2016 with literally probably not going to have any boats in a year's time. And we had three grand. You're not going to get very far with £3,000. However, something pretty lucky happened to us which i'm obviously not going to give this as a solution to all of you because we were unbelievably lucky for this to happen but loughborough have a scholarship program as i'm sure a lot of universities do um, and our club commodore at the time was was on a sports scholarship um, at fort sailing so he was invited to basically they have an annual scholars dinner where everyone that's receiving scholarship money goes along he chatted to probably the right guy that he ended up sat next to, who had an unbelievable amount of money. Um, one dinner later, £42,000 in the bank. So obviously I appreciate that's not a realistic way to fund boats, but it's about, I guess, the lessons learned is, is thinking outside the box. So if you do find yourself where you've not been successful getting sponsorship, grants aren't really coming your way, don't just base yourself on those investigate does your university have like what they call a philanthropy program or any kind of scholarship program and will that team be kind of helpful to your cause so i guess another top tip is is using those networks so i'm aware that some university clubs do get sponsors for for boats or for events things like that um, and a lot of the time that comes through people's networks so perhaps did someone do a placement year or a year in industry with a company can you go and speak to them will they be more likely to help you do you have alumni that are now, you know, maybe they set up their own business or they're working for quite a rich company? Can they help you out? Um, and then just on that note of sponsorship, smaller is always better. So if you're going to people asking for £40,000, the chances of getting that are pretty much next to zero. So can you actually apply for smaller things? And if people aren't interested in funding boats, maybe if you run, for example, a team racing event, can you find a social sponsor for that event? that's going to give you the money to pay for the punch at the social that's 200 300 pounds that you would have blown on alcohol but actually that can go into your savings pot for new boats because you've got a sponsor that's going to pay for that um so think about you know pass this on to your treasurers or whoever but smaller is always better and much more likely to get 100 pounds from a local business than you are 40,000 pounds I've said this already, but investigate philanthropy if you haven't already, because like I said, that did wonders for us. Um, this is being very stereotypical, but a lot of donors on universities are of a certain age, have a lot of money. A lot of them are very into sailing. So if you can get involved and get that team to kind of be on your side, potentially they can put you in front of the right kind of people that actually will listen when you say, we've got 50 students that aren't going to be able to sail next year because we won't have any boats um, and they do have the means to, to make some donations. And just finally, on the fundraising front, perseverance is absolutely key. Like I said, it was literally at least four or five years of fixing boats all day, every day, having zero money. And it was just one lucky break at the end of the day. So make sure just keep trying. Essentially, you'll get things eventually. And there are other ways that people have fundraised. So for example, crowdfunding, that's something that I know Exeter used this year um, and a number of other clubs might do as well. Um, and people do get grants 
there's been clubs that have managed to get Sport England grants, things like that in the past. So just investigate every single option, think outside the box and you'll get there eventually. Um, so yeah, point number three is what next? Now, the purpose is not for you to read this spreadsheet. The purpose is for you just to see the amount of numbers that went into it. So the key thing really is if you are lucky enough to have new boats, you found the funding, maybe your, your AU has managed to give you some one-off money, you've got a grant, you've got a donation, whatever it is, you've now got new boats. The key thing is now, that's not the end of the process. So I get for you guys, that is the end. You might be graduating the year after, but if you can really encourage your club to, to think into the future, the key thing is around doing your homework. So this is an example of what we did this year. So basically in 2016, we had brand new, well, 20, summer 2017, brand new boats from Rhonda, thanks to this nice donation. That was then an opportunity. We could have sat back and thought, cool, we've got brand new boats. We'll just leave them another 25 years. And then in 25 years, maybe our kids will be at uni having the exact same issue that we've just struggled for five years on. Um, the key thing is actually, once you've got those new boats, is keeping them rolling like a rolling replacement program and there are examples of universities that do this really really well oxford and cambridge are probably the ones that come straight to mind but if you've got a set of three-year-old boats you can sell them for substantially more money than a 25 year old set of boats so actually we tried to view that as an opportunity so we got the boats in summer 2017 did three seasons worth of, of use out of them and then this year in january i managed to sell them for thirty thousand pounds so if you can sell your boats for 30 grand towards a new set already, and actually that funding gap in between is only 15, 20 grand, and that's much more realistic to earn yourself in terms of making savings from your club. So the first thing is doing your homework. Look back over as many years as you can. If your club is anything like mine, that probably won't be very many years because students are notoriously terrible at keeping like any kind of financial records. But look back over as many accounts as you can work out you know how much does your club make a year how much do you spend can you make any savings and really see what is there that you can save money on so you really need to understand that that kind of financial picture for your club you can then look forward so once you've got that idea of three or four years worth of budgets actually for the next three four five years what can you forecast that you're going to spend and save and then the third item is once you've got that kind of picture you need the right people involved so you need someone that is going to take ownership of the process. And I would kind of, I guess people do this already to get people on their committees, but keen freshers are the way forward. So if you're a final year, you've got yourself new boats, you're implementing this plan. That's no use because next year you're going to be gone. Equally, you don't want to recruit a second or third year because in a year's time, they're going to be gone too. What you need is some freshers that are gonna really take ownership of the process so that by the time they're graduating, they're looking at buying the next set of boats. And then I guess the key thing is around just planning worst case scenario. So it's no use doing all this kind of budget forecasting based on a good year. And I know obviously we could say anything about COVID here, but there are always gonna be years when you don't get quite the number of entries to your team racing event that you thought you were going to, or a fresher comes along and crashes a boat and you spend a bit more on boat replacement and boat kind of maintenance than you thought you were going to. So, so do try and plan for the worst case. Um, and then I guess the next thing, yeah, is once you've got all this information, put it together. So the key thing is you can spend as much time as you want on this. Obviously COVID lockdown gave me loads of time. So I wouldn't suggest that this is easy to do because it is easy when you're in lockdown you've got nothing else to do but i'd imagine usually people are quite busy so get the plan together but it's important to get everyone's buy-in so if you're on a committee make sure the whole committee is is kind of set on this you've got commitment from students across each year group that actually once you leave they're not just going to bin it all um and i guess that's the key thing so knowledge transfer have people lined up from each year group that are going to take this on once you leave and the one thing I would say that's been really beneficial about this, like whether this is going to help us or not, obviously I'm not going to be at uni in five years, so I don't know if they're going to fulfill this plan that we've put together. However, it is really useful for satisfying requirements, whether that's from your student's union um, or a donor. So for example, we had a very nice man who gave us an awful lot of money. It's been great for us over the last four or five years. We sent him termly reports. 
So from his perspective, that just gives him a bit more of a kind of, I guess, return on his investment. He knows what he's helped to fund. It would be rather rude to take 40 grand off someone and then ignore them. So actually having something like this to say, look, your investment has enabled us to put this into place. So hopefully, you know, if this is stuck to the club set for the future is really, really useful. But then again, the caveat is at the end of the day, the plan's always going to change. Like you're going to get years where the committee isn't as engaged or they don't, you know, they spend all the money. Everyone knows a year in their, in their club where that's happened. Um, so kind of accept that the plan's going to change and, and prep people to, to make those edits every year. Like this shouldn't be something that's set for five years. Our one is very much, this is the plan in 2020. It's going to be reviewed every year until you get new votes. And yet, just finally, if you're going to sell them, advertise your boats early like our boats the deal was arranged in january i was advertising them in june 2019 it takes a good seven eight nine ten months potentially longer to actually find a buyer a lot of the time so if you are planning on replacing your boat soon and you're going to sell the ones you've got get on it really early is, is my top tip essentially a year ahead of when you want new ones and then hopefully this will change slides Cool. So just some final final lessons learned. So obviously it's a bit of a unique situation. Buying two brand new sets of boats from Ronda in essentially a three year period is, is a pretty rogue thing to do. And we did actually learn a lot of lessons from doing that. It started off very much as one person's big idea. That person then graduated and I kind of got left to implement it. And let's just say it wasn't as easy as I had been led to believe when I was a fresher. Um, so yeah, as I've said, finding that 50K is just not the end of the process. You need to see that as the beginning of the process. What you don't want is to find the 50K and in 10 years time, the club is in the same position. That money should be the opportunity to implement a program that's gonna allow you to replace the boats on a regular basis, or at the very least should lead to a maintenance program that's going to lead to those boats being sustained over a longer period of time, rather than just buying new ones, ignoring them for three years, and then they start to fall apart. Um, second one is club savings accounts. So our athletic union were quite helpful in that they allowed us to set up a savings account aside from our normal account. That's a really good way of saying whatever's left in the normal account, we leave 1500 pounds in it to start the next academic year. Anything above that money goes into the savings account and then we don't touch it. That's just a pot of money that grows until you need to sell the boats. So have that chat with the rescue if you don't have one already and set one up if you can. Do your research, plan, change the plan each year. It's, it's not going to be the same. The situation isn't going to be the same. Knowledge transfer is key. So get those keen freshers on board. And basically the more people you can get to buy into this and the more that actually the whole club knows this is the plan, um, we need to keep the boats in good condition because we want to sell them in two years time. That's really helpful. Um, and again, as Keith was saying earlier about attitudes towards the boats, that was something that was really useful at Loughborough, um, just making sure people were aware of that. Probably the biggest of my top tips, anyone that's bought boats from Rondar recently would, would know this, but if you haven't bought boats from Rondar recently, my top tip would be prepare yourself for the so-called Rondar inflation. So when we made these plan, obviously we made a big error in that the initial three year plan didn't involve inflation at all. We kind of thought 42K in 2017, is going to be 42k in 2020. We were very, very wrong on that. Um, as it says on that slide, in 2017, we paid around 42 grand all in for a six brand new fireflies, sales, trailers, everything. In 2020, that figure was 53,000 pounds. So any mathematicians amongst you can work out that is massively above what you would expect inflation to be. So just be aware when you've got a sole builder such as Ronda, they can charge whatever they like, essentially. Um, and yeah, the, the inflation has been ridiculous over the past few years. So that's something when we've now implemented our plan. We did 2017, we did 2020. We're now planning for 2025. Um, that inflation is something that has formed quite a key part of that. Linking to that, three years was not long enough. If you buy new boats and you say, right, we're going to sell them in three years time. I would say don't like it's not long enough to save that 10, 15, 20 grand you need to top up the, the basically the deficit between what you sell them for and what you buy them for. 
So the key thing here to understand is the depreciation. Keith has said about that already. Actually, what is the period of time that's going to be useful for um, being able to keep your boats in a usable condition? There's a point at which they start going downhill, you know, and the sails get too old. You think, oh, actually things start to break. The key thing is understanding that point. And actually, Keith probably has a bit more insight into this, but a lot of the private schools who school team race work to more the kind of four to six years um, turnaround time. So I would recommend if you're planning this kind of thing, don't do three years, do four, five, six years. Uh, it's a lot more realistic because that's about, you know, what two grand a year to save or find in, in sponsorship. Um, and finally, as we've said 7,000 times already, but maintenance is just going to make your life so much easier. Um, links to that shared ownership culture, someone has to be the don't break the boats person. I'm sure you're all sat there thinking there's a don't break the boats person in my club. Um, and if there isn't, maybe that needs to be you because it does, you know, while people might grumble at you, it does make life a lot easier in the long run. So yeah, that's kind of my uh, just insight into that. And, and what I would say is, as Keith and Joe have said, do speak to them with any questions. Um, also feel free if it is a question more around like long-term funding, planning, that kind of thing, feel free to get in touch with the Booster Committee email address on the bottom of the screen and, and I'd be more than happy to discuss things in a bit more detail with you. Um, but yeah, does anyone have any questions? I've got a few that have come in earlier, so we'll start with those. If you have questions from the people that are on the call, if you could type them into the chat, and in um, the meantime, do you, do you mind if yeah. I just chip in for just two seconds? Of course, do yeah. Lovely. Um, so yeah, just just um, uh, just an NFA sort of um, answer to a couple of things that have been raised. Um, in terms of looking after your boats, absolutely. Um, as as a university sailing club, um, it can be super tough to um, keep your boats well looked after. Um, at the NFA, we have really good links with Marlow Ropes. So last year, for instance, we had about 600 pounds worth of rope that we got for free. Uh, and that rope went largely towards re-rigging Bournemouth and who else was it? I'm being told. Um, Bournemouth and, and a couple of other clubs boats uh, when they came to the nationals and they came to the inlands um, and they said, we've got these boats, but they're, they're not fantastic. We said, great, let's re-rig them for you. Um, and that's, that's just because they, they came to an event um, and that's the sort of thing the NFA does. Um, in terms of um, what Joe was talking about uh, with networks and what you've touched on, Abby, um, the NFA is, is largely there as a, a network for you guys to leverage. Um, there are all of those, all of those people who um, have sailed Fireflies at uni and who've, who've then uh, gone on to sell fireflies in the future like myself um, we've got a lot of those people on the committee now so it's not exactly uh, it's not what you might have thought it, it was in the past where um, I think the NFA has potentially been perceived as a bunch of weird people with beards talking about fairy um, we're not those people anymore um, I mean I, I graduated what five years ago I'm a professional engineer um, and we've got a lot of those people now on the committee making sure that the NFA is working for you guys because we love sailing fireflies amongst loads of other stuff um, and we want to make sure that you guys and students in general get the best incentives to come firefly sailing um, after you leave university. So uh, we're also here um, to talk about so, uh, insurance. Um, until very recently, the class has had a good relationship with one of the major insurers. Unfortunately, that's ended. However, we are we have a very hardworking uh, PR and sponsorship um, officer, and she is working hard to get a new deal with an insurer. And that will cover you, importantly, for masts and sails as well. A lot of insurance, um, this goes back to what Keith was saying, with um, just buying, getting the cheapest thing which is saves clubs money, but you'll find a lot with insurance that um, a lot of insurers don't actually insure you for your masts and your sails. They'll just insure you for your boats and stuff like that. So, um, and it's things like that, that that we're here to help you with um, and to point you in the right direction. You'll also find um, 
So obviously we love sailing fireflies and um, the, the sailing fireflies as a fleet is really fun. Um, the socials also pretty good as well. Um, but we want more students to come along. And the thing is, is that if students come along to our events, then um, you get in touch with that whole network. If you've got any issues at all, um, you can also just give us a shout. There's a huge, um, a huge wealth of knowledge about fireflies, about um, the, the marine industry in general. So for instance, uh, our, um, our PR officer and our uh, vice chairman uh, both work in the marine industry. They have done for a number of years. Um, they're very good friends of mine, but they're also very good contacts for everybody else to have if you want advice about how you're handling things. Um, and also for your, for your Rondar um, relationship. So for instance, that Rondar inflation, um, that's really good stuff to uh, come to the NFA with, because uh, as the technical secretary, I manage that relationship. Um, and I'm trying to take a much more active approach to managing that relationship as it has done in the past. So, so things like that, where if you see, if you ask how much is six boats and you get a number and you say, oh, that's a bit more than we were expecting, you can come to the NFA. Unfortunately, the time has passed now, but anybody else in the future come to the NFA if you've got any problems with the class builder, because um, we have really close ties with the RYA now. Um, I've put a lot of effort into building a relationship with the RYA technical and the RYA legal departments. Um, so we have a really close working relationship now. So together we're trying to work to improve the way that Rondar works, both for the NFA and for students as well. Um, because let's face it, there's much, many, many more students sailing fireflies than there are anybody else. So we want to make sure that that, that relationship's working for you. Um, so yeah, I, you know, any questions, um, please give us a shout. I mean, as a bit of background, I, I'm an engineer by training. I, I've been fiddling with boats for the last 20 years. So, and I'm a technical secretary. So, you know, we, we just try and, we try and make it work and we're not a bunch of weirdos where we are actually, well, come to, a, come to a Firefly event and you'll see that we're actually pretty like standard people. So yeah, uh, that's Great. pretty much it. But yeah, happy to answer any questions. Thanks Alex, that was really useful. Um, okay, cool. So the first question I've got came in via the Instagram from someone called Ellie. So thank you, Ellie, for your question. Um, and Ellie's question is, what is the most effective type of gunnel in the long run if you're replacing the whole lot? So potentially, Keith, this is a question for you. Get your views on that. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. It is one of the never ending questions. What gunnels, what gunnels, what gunnels? Rubber, wood, plastic. Yeah. Um, I wrote a blog post on this uh, probably 18 months, two years ago. Um, if it was my choice, I would always um, go for a laminated wooden gun um, over most of the other options that are currently out there. And that's primarily because of how it works in terms of transferring impacts during collisions. Now, all of the different guns have different benefits depending on what way you look at it. So a gunnel to gunnel impact, a rubber, a rubber gunnel protector is going to work better than a wooden one, but a T-bone situation, a laminated wood one is going to spread the load better than either the rubber one or um, the L-shaped sort of wooden moulding that quite a lot of the boats have, which seem to shatter quite quickly. Um, yeah, there's no, there is no right answer. Budget has an impact, obviously. Um, rubber tends to be cheap, um, which obviously is an advantage. Um, however, it does sag and look a mess if it's not installed properly. And yeah, as I say, it is effective in a gunnel to gunnel sort of rubbing situation, but in a T-bone, it doesn't actually protect the boat at all. Um, so it's... Uh, it's a different one. Um, combine gunnels with bow fenders and everything else, actually those sorts of things, yeah, it's a, it's a combined thought process, not just a single one-way thing. hope that answers it. Any other thoughts Great, or questions you. on that one? Not from me. I have a second question um, 
which kind of links a bit to Yuki, but maybe it's a bit to Alex as well. So the first one is around how long should sales last? That That's probably a bit of a, a rogue one, but I guess maybe a way to develop that question is at what point should you know that you need to replace your sales? Um, so maybe we'll deal with that bit first, Keith, if that's okay. Oh, that's it, when to replace a sale is almost an impossible, is, a, is an almost an impossible question. Um, so what, what makes a good sale? What makes a bad sale? I think it is as much about actually, is it again, providing the service, are sales providing the service that you need them to provide? If you're finding that when you're going sailing every time you're spending more time sending them away to sail makers, your battens are falling out and so on and so forth, then yeah, maybe you do need to think about repairing, replacing sales. It's a whole series of stories in terms of how to replace sales and everything else. You know, an old set of sales are a perfect thing to send away to get cut down so that you've actually got a set of reasonable cut downs before. Don't buy new cut downs. They're only ever going to go up in strong winds. Take your old sales, cut a couple of feet off, ask a sail maker to cut a couple of feet off the bottom and they'll be fantastic. Similarly, the class association has some really good links with Hyde. Hyde do three different different specs of sales, and Alex will be able to sort of follow me up on this. So there's a team, there's a standard standard set, there's a team racing spec, and there's also a schools spec of sale. The school spec of sale is only available in white. It's a very very heavy cloth. Um, the team racing spec is generally what you would expect to see with your coloured sales, and then the fleet the standard spec is is the lightweight fleet racing spec. For a university, I wouldn't ever recommend you buying your fleet race, a fleet racing set for day-to-day -day use. Again, they, they, they will be cheaper because there's simply just not as much material in them, but they are not going to last as long. If you desperately want coloured sales, buy a team, buy, speak to Hyde, so get your discount through the association and get your coloured set of sales. If you really want to go full on, full on with it, though, and they are expensive, the school set should last normally. Um, I worked on a lifetime of about eight to ten years for a school spec set of sales that were being used three or four to five times a week. So the school spec set of sales is certainly a well worthwhile investment. Uh, Alex, I don't know whether you want to add anything more to that. Uh, yeah, so um, all I'll say is that definitely uh, buying your sales through the association, um, you get a big fat discount um, on your set of sales. I can't remember exactly um, how much it is, but it's in the hundreds I think, of pounds. I think, I, I want to say it's 10%, but it's, it's, it might even be more than that, I think, isn't it? Um, I, think, I think it's about £100 per set. Um, yeah. But um, that's that's just roughly. Oh, apparently, I'm told it's fifteen percent. Um, so no, for short. So um, the school spec and the uh, team racing spec are uh, the same weight of cloth. It's just that the school spec um, has more reinforcement on the corners and along the battens. Um, but yeah, totally. Um, I don't really have anything to add um, apart from buy it through the association. The association gets kicked back as well, which um, helps us provide things like free beer for students um, at events at Lyme Regis. We use that money to give every student, every student fleet that entered um, uh, more than three boats, got something like 24 litres of cider um, for their team. Um, and that's, that's some of the stuff that we can fund with that um, kickback money. But yeah, order through the association, um, buy the, certainly buy the team racing spec ones, um, I would say probably if you're using them four or five times a week and you you want to, like Joe said, be taking that pride in your fleet, you're probably looking at replacing them every couple of years. Um, but that said, the, the really heavy spec ones will just last and last and last. Uh, the sales that Hyde's turns out for the association now are pretty good quality. Um, so yeah, but, but probably every couple of years if you want to keep them to tip top, but that's about it. Great, thank you. And then I guess the kind of second part to that was just, are we allowed replica sales at events? And I guess this depends on the events. Um, but probably one so, of the 
it that's def depends. definitely an Alex question. <laughs> yeah, so it, it does depend on the event. Um, so I would always say that if you're going to buy replacement sales, um, buy them from Hyde's and go through the association. Um, Hyde's provide a very good product for the money that you are paying. Um, and we've worked with Hyde's for a number of years to make sure that exactly what you're getting is the thing that you need for a Firefly. If you want to come to a Firefly, um, uh, so, so an event run by the National Firefly Association, and we're probably talking the Nationals and the Inlands, um, then you need to have um, sales from Hyde's. Um, that's, that's pretty much it. Um, so people have in the past um, bought their sales from uh, non-class legal uh, suppliers. Um, it has been done. Um, all I will say is that um, they're not they're not class legal. The the sales aren't necessarily cut in the best way um, for the rig um, or for the way that you are going to have been taught to sail your Firefly. So they're not necessarily the quickest. Uh, the quality isn't always brilliant. Um, and so the value for money isn't always there. I'd, I'd back up Alex up on that through all of the fleets that I've run and with the Firefly with the Firefly fleets in particular, the hide sales certainly is far and away the more resilient in terms of what we've actually worked with. And yes, you can find cheaper. Yes, you can get probably them quicker, but you are not going to get a sale necessarily that's going to be up there or as good. And as Alex said, it's class legal. It makes sense. And actually spending that little bit of extra, as we talked about before, just is good money in the right place oh and sorry sorry Keith, just to add um so just to highlight in the past it's been the case that team racing sales weren't class legal uh, we changed the class rules about three or four years ago now so you can use your colored um class your, your colored team racing sales uh, any spec as long as they're from hides um at any firefly fleet racing event everybody's happy with that um We've had all kinds of colours at the Nationals in the past. Nobody, nobody cares. It's all good. Um, and also you can save some money um, on your air freight. I've just remembered if you speak to Hyde's, well, when you order through the association, um, you'll actually talk to a chap called Tony Thresher, um, who's a really nice guy, um, and he deals with Hyde's for us. If you ask him to ask Hyde's very nicely to fold your sails, um, and send them, you can then send them uh, air freight delivery and save yourself, I think it's about 5% extra on the price. Uh, don't quote me on that, um, but it can make things a bit cheaper if you ask them to be folded. Great, thank you. Sorry, can I, uh, uh, Alex, I'll ask that question offline at some point. Sure. Okay, cool, thanks. And then if anyone's got any questions they want to stick in the chat, I don't think we've had any at the moment, but I've got one more that was sent in earlier. Um, and I actually will back this one from Luff, but, um We've had issues with bow protector screws coming out. So I guess that's around the Rondar bow protectors that they supply come obviously fixed, tied onto the bow at the top, but there's a screw that goes through the bottom into the, the front of the bow, essentially. Um, so the question says, we've had issues with bow protector screws coming out. What's the recommendation for the best way to avoid this, fix it, or an alternative solution? This could be a Keith question. Um, <clears throat> bow fenders are really important um, in terms of what you have. There are a number of styles, there are a number of designs out there. Ronda one fits really nicely on the boat. Effectiveness in a collision, go back to what we were talking about in terms of gunnel protectors. The Ronda one is good in certain collisions. The, some of the others that are out there could are better in other conditions. Now, on some of the boats, we also look at having um, a stem protector, which is generally a harder piece of rubber that extends down below the bow fender. Um, and actually protects the very bottom of the forefoot. Um, that, if you have that, it's not compatible with the Rondo one with the screw in the bottom. I, on a personal perspective, have a slight, slight concern about having a 
fender that is held on with a screw where a screw head itself is actually something that can actually cause damage going forwards. So I've, on, a, on a, in a honest, in an honest state, I have not used and I've not specced my boat to have the Rondar bow fender. Um, I've generally sourced them from elsewhere um, simply because then they can be tied on with string through the gunnel um, and don't then cause additional problems when actually they're, they are involved in the collision. This is also an area that I noticed in refitting Loughborough's old flight, now UHI's flight. If you've had repeated impacts around the screw head, the stress fractures that go through the hull on older boats becomes quite an interesting uh, problem to fix. So the kind of few times I've had to uh, deal with it as an issue, cutting it out and starting again was the easy, the kind of most straightforward solution. Um, so at this point, to kind of reiterate, uh, reiterate what Keith said, talking to other people about what your kind of alternatives might be might be a sensible kind of solution or potentially if you can find a way of removing the screw in itself and that and keeping it fixed in place then maybe that's your better plan there are there are there are ways and means um to modify the rondar fender um such that actually it doesn't need the screw in the bottom um for whoever it was that answered that question abby i'm quite happy to talk to them off the line about what they can do in terms of make some changes to the fender relatively cheaply and easily so that it doesn't need the screw to be there if needs. Actually from our experience just with the boats we bought in 2017, um, three years down the line we've had that same issue that Joe was talking about where the screws fall out and then you can't put them back in because the hole is bigger. Um, you get that stress fracture in the gel coat around the hole as well so actually the solution we came up with was Oh, we also had a few where, this is another good one with that bow protector, if you hit it at a certain angle, sometimes the bow protector can actually be ripped. So the fabric that is attached to the screw is now not there and you can't, like the screw's in the hole, but there's nothing attached to it. So a solution there is, as Keith said, you can tie, we had pieces of string going from the bottom of the bow protector back to the shrouds um, attachments, um, which just held it down and then just filled in the holes with, with gel coat. Um, I, th I, th I think just sort of on that, there's, we've, We've used, we've used Fireflies for a long time in team racing and we've been through a lot of different things. There's lots of different there's kits out there, there's lots of different things out there that can help and there's lots of different versions of kit. Now, you know, I've, I've done quite a lot of development work to come up with some ideas. Some of those will suit some of you, some of them won't suit some of you. Um, so it's that sort of you know, there's lots of opinions, there's, there's lots of ideas, there's lots of different bits of kit that can be suitable, that can be used. And actually it is a little bit of choosing what's right for you, choosing what's right for your budget, choosing what actually fits into the rest of your fleet and your plans going forward with your fleet. So yeah, there's no necessarily one size fits all. I, yeah, I'm very happy to try and have a chat, to chat with people. And I try and be as honest as I can in terms of if I think I've got a solution that will work for you, then great, I'll be trying to help you. If I think that actually you might be better to look at another solution or something else that's coming out from somewhere else, then I'm more than happy generally to try and direct you in that way. So I'm, uh, along with Alex and the rest of the association in that sense, you know, although I don't have an affiliation with the association, you know, the expertise and the experience is out there just go out and ask because we're all happy to try and help we've probably been there we've probably seen the problem and actually we generally have some ideas as how actually you can help yourself to fix it for a reasonable budget absolutely um i i would say if you've got a hole and you need to put a screw in it and it's too big um get some epoxy from a, a tube of six quid epoxy from b&q and buy yourself some teeny weeny um uh, syringes from eBay for about 10p and then inject some epoxy into it, wait for it to go off and then drill the hole again the right size. But that's just how I did things when I was a student. Um, Abby, if you could give give me a shout after this and let me know who sent you that because that sounds like an issue that we can go to Rondar with and say, please do this differently. Yeah, great. Okay. 
Thank you. So that's kind of it for questions. Um, in terms of contact details going forward, um, Keith and Joe's email addresses are in the slides. This is going to go on our YouTube, so you'll be able to access them through that. Um, equally, Alex, am I probably right in saying the best way to contact the NFA could be through their social media? They've, you've got quite an active uh, Instagram, haven't you? And I guess you've got the website where people can find details to contact you guys. Yeah. Um, so we're currently um, actually changing our web provider. Um, so I would, um, the website's a little bit clunky at the moment. I can only apologise for that. Um, but find us on Facebook um, and find us on Instagram and um, just drop us a message on either one and your um, inquiry will go to the right person. Great, perfect. And then just, just to wrap up, um, I know we've obviously been talking for a while, so wrap up nice and quickly. I guess the key points that we've been through, joint responsibility. Like if you're a bosun and you're on this call and you're thinking, oh my days, you've just said so much about maintaining boats, having a plan, having the plan to buy the next boats, and you're feeling a little bit overwhelmed. The key thing is it needs to be a committee responsibility. Like you need to get your captain involved. They're the ones that are on the water that can shout at people that are sailing like idiots and tell them to respect the boats. You need your treasurers involved, you need your secretaries involved, you need your commodores on board. Like it needs to be a joint responsibility. What's the plan? So obviously I spoke a lot about plans and you may be in a situation where you've got pretty decent boats at the moment and you think actually it's not gonna affect me, they're gonna be fine for the next three years I'm at uni. Try and think more in the future. Um, I know it doesn't really impact you, but maybe, maybe it's good karma if you can put something in place that's gonna help people in, in 10, 15 years time. Who are you taking it on next year? So as Keith said, have the next person lined up, find your bosun replacement, train them early. And then the same again, prevention is better than cure. Cool. So I guess the last thing for me to say is, is get in touch if you have any questions, um, either with one of the contacts listed in here or with Booster in general. Thank you very much for coming and massive thank you to Keith, Joe and Alex for expertise. That was very appreciated. I think there's been some really useful things on this. So we'll be sure to, to share the YouTube video so other people can, can make the best of it. But yeah, that's it from us. Thank you very much. I remember to stop the recording. Hope everyone has a good evening. Okay. Thank you, thank you very much.